Okay, nerds, um, it's Ray Bradbury's 100th birthday, and if you know me, you know that's a huge deal. Um, I've got my, my special Ray Bradbury birthday shirt. Um, I was introduced to the Ray Bradbury Experience Museum a couple years ago. They exist in his hometown of Waukegan, Illinois, and they have been working for years to create a museum where people can go and not only learn about Ray Bradbury, but experience the stories he told. And so my goal today for Ray's 100th birthday is to get 100 donations for the Ray Bradbury Experience Museum. I don't necessarily think you need to go and donate a lot of money. If you do, that's great. Like, please do that. But it would be wonderful to sign 100 new people up for learning about Ray and learning about the morality and a lot of his stories and his impact on our culture and our world as a whole. Um, so if you screen grab your PayPal donation, go to the Ray Bradbury Experience Museum site. They've got a PayPal donation uh, and then just screen grab it and I will add every single one of them to my stories. I'm really, really hoping that we can get 100 people today. So that's our goal. I wanna celebrate Ray in a way that preserves his work for future generations. As you can see, this is only like a fraction of my Ray collection. Um, we've got first editions, we've got lovely fairy tales that I read to my kids. We've got the paperbacks that I've carried with me through college. We've got biographies that are signed by Ray. Um, this book of, of the illustrated life of Ray Bradbury is one of my favorites. And then yeah, I've got, I've got a lot of signed Ray books, you know, this is what I hoard. This is what I gift myself sometimes. Um, my most special one, obviously Dandelion Wine is the project of his that has meant the most to me. Um, I definitely have the script version of it. Anytime a community theater wants to do that with me, sign me up. Um, but my love who just entered the room got me Dandelion Wine first edition, signed copy from July 1958. Uh, this really meant a lot to me. This was my Christmas present this year, and I love it. So, um, speaking of dandelion wine, I got this version of the book when I was 19 years old. I was wandering through the West Village and really lonely for home, and I saw this book very much on sale. <laughs> it was like $3.00 on a table outside of a bookstore and I picked it up and read the forward and was immediately hooked. I went on to share it with friends of mine. Um, there's a director, James Ponsol. He, uh, he's directed a lot of really wonderful movies, um, but he was in my acting class when I was 19 years old and I remember giving him a copy of this and we would just pour over it at the Renaissance Diner in Hell's Kitchen and analyze every single part of it and, and daydream about making this a movie one day. But this forward changed how I looked at things, especially how I looked at the imagery in small towns. So, for Ray's birthday, I want to read you some of it. This book, like most of my books and stories, was a surprise. I began to learn the nature of such surprises, thank God, when I was a fairly young writer. Before that, like every beginner, I thought you could beat, pummel, and thrash an idea into existence. Under such treatment, of course, any decent idea folds up its paws, turns on its back, and fixes its eyes on eternity and dies. It was with great relief then that in my early 20s, I floundered into a word association process in which I simply got out of bed each morning, walked to my desk, and put down any word or series of words that happened along in my head. I would then take arms against the word, or for it, and bring on an assortment of characters to weigh the word and show me its meaning in my life. An hour or two hours later, to my amazement, a new story would be finished and done. The surprise was total and lovely. I soon found that I would have to work this way for the rest of my life. First, I rummaged my mind for words that could describe my personal nightmares, fears of night, and time from my childhood, and I shaped stories from these. Then I took a long look at the green apple trees and the old house I was born in, 
and the house next door where I lived with my grandparents and all the lawns of the summers I grew up in. And I began to try words for all of that. What you have here in this book is a gathering of dandelions from all those years. The wine metaphor, which appears again and again in these pages, is wonderfully apt. I was gathering images all of my life, storing them away and forgetting them. Somehow, I had to send myself back with words as catalysts to open the memories out and see what they had to offer. So from the age of 24 to 36, hardly a day passed when I didn't stroll myself across a recollection of my grandparents' northern Illinois grass, hoping to come across some old half-burnt firecracker, a rusted toy or a fragment of letter written to myself in some young year, hoping to contact the older person I became to remind him of his past, his life, his people, his joys and his drenching sorrows. It became a game that I took to with immense gusto to see how much I could remember about dandelions themselves or picking wild grapes with my father and brother, rediscovering the mosquito breeding ground rain barrel by the side bay window or searching out the smell of gold fuzzed bees that hung around our back porch grape arbor. Bees do have a smell, you know, and if they don't, they should for their feet are dusted with spices from a million flowers. And then I wanted to call back what the ravine was like, especially on those nights when walking home late across town after seeing Lon Chaney's delicious fright, The Phantom of the Opera, my brother Skip would run ahead and hide under the Ravine Creek Bridge like the lonely one and leap out and grab me, shrieking, so I ran, fell, and ran again gibbering all the way home. That was great stuff. Along the way, I came upon and collided through word association with old and true friendships. I borrowed my friend John Huff from my childhood in Arizona and shipped him east to Greentown so I could say goodbye to him properly. Along the way, I sat me down to breakfast, lunches, and dinners with the long dead and much loved for I was a boy who did indeed love his parents and grandparents and his brother, even when that brother ditched him. Along the way, I found myself in the basement working the wine press for my father or on the front porch Independence Night, helping my Uncle Byam load and fire his homemade brass cannon. Thus, I fell into surprise. No one told me to surprise myself, I might add. I came on the old and best ways of writing, through ignorance and experiment and was startled when truth, truths leaped out of bushes like quail before gunshot. I blundered into creativity as blindly as any child learning to walk and see. I learned to let my senses and my past tell me all that was somehow true. So I turned myself into a boy, running to bring a dipper of clear rainwater out of that barrel by the side of the house I had plenty of memories and sense impressions to play with, not work with, no, play with. So it's not work if you love it, it's play. Dandelion wine is nothing if it is not the boy hidden the man playing in the fields of the Lord on the green grass of other Augusts in the midst of starting to grow up, grow old and sense darkness waiting under the trees to seed the blood. I was amused and somewhat astonished at a critic a few years back who wrote an article analyzing dandelion wine, plus the more realistic works of Sinclair Lewis, wondering how I could have been born and raised in Waukegan, which I renamed Greentown for my novel, and not noticed how ugly the harbor was and how depressing the coal docks and rail yards down below the town. This is what got me. But of course I had noticed them. And genetic enchanter that I was, I was fascinated with their beauty. Trains and boxcars and the smell of coal and fire are not ugly to children. Ugliness is a concept that we happen on later and become self-conscious about. Counting boxcars is a prime activity of boys. Their elders fret and fume and jeer at the trains that hold them up, but Boys happily count and cry the names of the cars as they pass from far places. 
And again, that supposedly ugly rail yard was where carnivals and circuses arrived with elephants who washed the brick pavements with mighty steaming acid waters at five in the dark morning. As for the coal from the docks, I went down in my basement every autumn to await the arrival of the truck and its metal chute, which clanged down and released a ton of beauteous meteors that fell out of far space into my cellar and threatened to bury me beneath dark treasures. In other words, if your boy is a poet, horse manure can only mean flowers to him, which is, of course, what horse manure has always been about. Waukegan, Greentown. Greentown did exist then, right? Yes. Yes, it did. Was there a real boy named John Huff? There was. And that was truly his name. But he didn't go away from me. I went away from him. But happy ending. He is still alive 42 years later and remembers our love. Was there a lonely one? There was. And that was his name. And he moved around at night in my hometown when I was six years old and he frightened everyone and was never captured. Most importantly, did the big house itself with grandpa and grandma and the boarders and uncles and aunts in it exist? Well, I've already answered that. Is the ravine real and deep and dark at night? It was, it is. I took my daughters there a few years back, fearful that the ravine might have gone shallow with time. I'm relieved and happy to report that the ravine is deeper, darker, and more mysterious than ever. I would not, even now, go there after seeing Phantom of the Opera. So there you have it. Waukegan was Greentown. With all the happiness that that means, with all the sadness that these names imply, the people there were gods and midgets and knew themselves mortal, and so they walked tall so as to not embarrass the gods, and the gods crouched so as to make the small ones feel at home. After all, isn't that what life is all about? The ability to go around back and come up inside other people's heads to look out at the damn fool miracle and say, Oh, oh, so that's how you see it. Well, now, I must remember that. Here is my celebration, then, of death as well as life dark as well as light, old as well as young, smart and dumb, combined, sheer joy as well as complete terror, written by a boy who once hung upside down in trees, dressed in his bat costume with candy fangs in his mouth, who finally fell out of the trees when he was 12 and went and found a toy dial typewriter and wrote his first novel. A final memory, fire balloons, you rarely see them these days, though. In some countries, I hear they're still made and filled with warm breath from a small straw fire hung beneath. But in 1925, Illinois, we still had them. And one of the last memories I have of my grandfather is the last hour of a 4th of July night, 48 years ago, when Grandpa and I walked out on the lawn and lit a small fire and filled the pear-shaped red, white, and blue striped paper balloon with our hot air and held the flickering bright angel presence in our hands a final moment in front of a porch lined with uncles and aunts and cousins and mothers and fathers and then very softly let the thing that was life and light and mystery go out of our fingers up on the summer air and away over the beginning to sleep houses among the stars as fragile as wondrous, as vulnerable, as lovely as life itself. Oh, he's such a good writer. I see my grandfather there looking up at that strange drifting light, thinking his own still thoughts. I see me, my eyes filled with tears <laughs> because it was all over, the night was done. I knew there would never be another night like this. No one said anything. We all just looked up at the sky and we breathed out and in. And we all thought the same things, but no one said. Someone finally had to say though, didn't they? And that one was me. The wine still waits in the cellars below. 
My beloved family still sits on the porch in the dark. The fire balloon still drips and burns in the night sky of an as yet unburied summer. Why and how? Because I say it is so. Ray Bradbury Summer, 1974. I love this book. I love artists that find the beauty and the really hard stuff because right now it's really hard. It's been over 10 minutes. <laughs> and we have kids that must be taken to the pool and must be entertained and to celebrate all the good stuff that's hidden in the bad, I really hope we can all celebrate Ray's birthday by donating to a museum that's gonna honor him. So make your donations, celebrate 100 years of Ray Bradbury, and have a glorious summer. Happy birthday! Say happy birthday! Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Happy birthday. Happy birthday.